Well, hi, everyone out there. Thank you so much for tuning in to Love at First Laugh, the Green Room Edition. Uh, today, I am so happy because a dear friend of mine who is smart, funny, and just pure love and light, you've seen her on Too Close for Comfort. You have seen her on Curb Your Enthusiasm. You've seen her everywhere, okay? She, her credits are just endless. She has also segued into directing and writing and loves to perform stand-up and in theater. Please welcome the fabulous, gorgeous, amazing, smart, funny, beautiful, Lydia Cornell. Oh, that's such a beautiful introduction. I didn't just love that. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, you are so welcome. You are the sweetest. I love it. Oh, you are the sweetest. You're like pure love and light. You're like such a beautiful soul. That's so sweet of you. I wasn't always, but you, and you are as well, I have to say. So I wasn't thing. always either. <laughs> I was a, a little shit back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was a little shit too. <laughs> well, we'll talk about <laughs> our little shitness. <laughs> it's a long time to grow some grace. Oh, yes. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Grace is my favorite word, by the way. I love it. Um, so oh. let's start with your career, because we're going to talk about um, your recovery and how it ties to your career and your life and your books and all the wonderful things that you've done and you keep doing. Um, so tell me the beginning of your career. Like, how did you get the role of Sarah Rush on Too Close for Comfort? It was a weird... Well, first of all, I was born in El Paso, Texas. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be, an, I wanted to go to Disneyland. The first trip to Disneyland, I decided I had to be an actress. Because mm. if I could live in a world of make-believe. And my father was a conductor and a, the first violinist, the concert master of the El Paso Symphony. He grew up in, Sh in Russia. He was born in Russia, grew up in Shanghai, and became a violinist, a very, a world-famous violinist. So when he finally came to America, met my mother at the Hollywood Bowl, he became the concertmaster of the El Paso Symphony, and they were doing the opera of Pinocchio. And I, was, he invited me to, invited me, my dad let me come to work with him one day. And I'm running around backstage going, oh my God, the whale, there was a set with the whale and Geppetto's workshop, and inside the whale was a lantern and a little desk and table. And I thought the actors get to play inside all this scenery. So I became <laughs> kind of enthralled with the theater. Mm -hmm and the, the world of make-believe. And I also, um, I was very creative as a child. Mm -hmm. and you know, when you're a creative child, you don't think there's a male or female version of you. You just think, I can do anything I want in the world. Yeah. It didn't dawn on me late until later that I had to, you know, be a girl and look perfect and pretty. And I had a very, very, I shouldn't say abusive mother, but I had a very strict mother who kind of forced me to constantly look perfect. She spent hours doing my hair, and I had a lot of trials with my mom growing up. Yeah, and I could not wait to get out of my house and run away from home and get to Hollywood. And instead, I went to Colorado. It was a detour for college, and I worked with all these rock stars at Caribou Ranch, which is, it was a little bit of fame. I figured I'd go in the back door of fame. I'd figure out how to get into the music business first. So I worked with Billy Joel and the Beach Boys, and I was like, I did everything you could do to break into that ranch. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, Grace, I think I was incredibly ambitious, but I didn't want anyone to know that I wanted to be an actress because it was a secret hidden dream. And um, I'd seen a lot of movies, my favorite movies with The Parent Trap with Haley Mills and then Romeo and Juliet with Olivia Hussey. <gasps> oh my God, yes. Oh God, and Leonard Whiting, they were so gorgeous. Yes. And so um, after college, I graduated college and I, this is a long story. My father died mm -hmm. in Holland. They were living in Holland at the time. And I took a U-Haul and my crummy old car and I just drove to Hollywood. And I was determined to make it in Hollywood, not knowing how hard it is to make it in Hollywood. Yeah. And this is a really bizarre story, but I walk, I was there for like three weeks and I, a man asked me on a date. It was an agent, a date with an agent. He took me out to La Scala. Oh. And I'm brand new in town. And we walk into this restaurant. And there's Natalie Wood, Aaron Spelling, Fred Astaire, and Robert Wagner at the front booth. Wow. And I'm like starstruck. My heart is pounding. And I'm like, oh, my God. These are like superstars. 
And this agent knew them. He sort of walked by their table, said hi, and then we sat across from them in a booth. And at one point during the dinner, Natalie Wood summoned me over to the table like this. She looked right at me and went like that. And I went, and I was shaking. And I walked over there and she said, Mr. Spelling would like to meet you. <gasps> and I'm like, hi. And he says, hey, you're an actress, right? Are you? And I said, I, I hope to be. And he said, why don't you come in? We're, we're trying to cast a new show called Bay Cat. It was called Bay Cats? It was beach detectives, a, a bikini detective and a couple guys on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> when you put your weapons, you know, yeah, like, when you put the gun, right? Oh, a gun yeah. weapon. So apparently, later Michelle Pfeiffer got the role. It was her first TV series and her only TV series, and luckily it didn't succeed. And then she got Scarface and went on to this big, illustrious movie career. But I got a chance to go meet Kathy Henderson the next day at the she was casting Love Boat. And I got my first love boat. I met the casting director. And my love boat audition, it was just me reading a couple lines. Then I got the part, right? So I go in and I'll have to wear a bikini. Of course, right? And I have to play shuffleboard. And I have two lines. And instead of, I don't know how to do anything on the set. It was brand new. I didn't even know what a set was. Oh, I really, wow. And I, I put, they put on too much makeup, like big cherry cheeks. I think I put in extra makeup. <laughs> thinking it would look good. They were look like a crazy person with huge black eye makeup. <laughs> and I'm playing shuffleboard and there's Artie Johnson, Audrey Meadows, who ended up playing my grandmother later on Too Close for Comfort, and a couple other, it was a really interesting role. I had like three lines, but I looked right in the camera at one point and the director goes, hey, darling, you know, what are you doing? You don't look in the camera, you look at the other actor so it doesn't look like you're breaking the fourth wall. So. <laughs> So I learned on the set and it was my first role. Oh my God. Wow. It was crazy. And then from there, I got um, three pilot auditions. One was for th something called Blue Jeans produced by Aaron Spelling and Leonard Goldberg. And I, I acted my heart out and I did not get it. Apparently they didn't like me at all. And so the third audition, and here's the luck of the draw. You, you're not allowed to sign up for another pilot audition if you got another one in the, in the works because you have to sign seven years of your life away. And this is what happened. It was raining. I didn't have a car at this point. My car was broken. These people discovered me at a party, the Laxes. And they also had a young actor named Michael J. Fox who was playing a 12-year-old. He was 21 playing a 12-year-old on a show called Palmerstown, USA. And... Um, they, I didn't know I knew who he was at the time. Apparently he later became pretty famous. Yeah. But they sent me on this audition called Too Close for Comfort. And I had to go all on a bus down to Hollywood somewhere. Yeah. The LA Studios. And I walk in and I'm late. I'm the last person they were going to see out of 400 girls. And this is a true story. I come in with bedraggled with wet hair, a, a cheerleader sweater, real tight jeans. Because that's the part. And she's a cheerleader. Yes. And I walk in and the secretary says, I said, I'm here for the, for the, for the audition. And she goes, I'm sorry, it's too late. You're, you're 30 minutes late and they're going home now. And Arnold Fulton, the producer who created Get Smart with Mel Brooks, he comes out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You, you should, yeah, Arnie's a cool, was a cool guy. God bless him. He passed away. But he comes out and he says, oh, let her read. She looks the part. And I walk in and there's Bob Stolfi, Arnie Sultan, the casting director, and Tom Werner, Carsey Werner. Tom Werner went on to, he owns the Boston Red Sox and he produces uh, the Connors right now. Yes. But he was Marcy Carsey's partner and they produced Roseanne, Third Rock from the Sun, Brace mm -hmm. Under Fire, blah, blah, blah. So I'm in, the, in these, the room with these people and there's a script pages they hand me, you know, and you're looking at your script pages and there's a line that I have, and the line is, in case you haven't noticed, we are two very sophisticated young women. And then it says, Sarah gives dad a raspberry. So I pick up an imaginary raspberry and I go, so there. And I thrust a raspberry at Arnie Sultan and he goes, what the hell are you giving me? You don't know what a raspberry is? And they all explode with laughter. A raspberry in showbiz lingo Grace, come on, you know what a raspberry is. A raspberry is a Bronx cheer. It's this obnoxious sound you make with your mouth. A raspberry is like, 
Okay. Did I have to do that? Can you do it? <laughs> Why did I do that? <laughs> I don't know if I can. <laughs> oh, my God. That is so funny. They all go, what planet are you from? And I, <laughs> They loved you. Yeah. <laughs> Texas? And they go, oh, my God. Can you be at the network tomorrow morning, at, you know, for the callbacks, the final callbacks? <laughs> I don't know what happened. I mean, I'm I'm going, here's a raspberry. And that is so cute. They exploded with laughter. They were laughing so hard. I was embarrassed. I didn't know what the hell was going on. The next day, um, I go in wearing a virginal flowered dress and all the other five other women for callback and for the role I'm up for, right? Yes. And I was going to the network to meet the president of ABC, Tony Thomopoulos, the president at the Schubert Theater upstairs. And they usher me in and they, um, and all the other girls are wearing cleavage and their nipples hanging out and cutoffs and over sexualized, right? Yeah. And I'm a virgin, right? And they have me read with Ted Knight in front of the president and, and the car seat. Oh Martin. my God, nerve wracking. I, I don't know why I wasn't nervous. I knew I was too. You were not. And I read with Ted and they laughed so hard. They were clapping and laughing. And I read with Deborah von Valkenberg, who apparently was already cast as my sister. And they said, we never do this. Arnie Sultan came up to me and says, we've never done this before. We usually call your agent first, but we're going to tell you right now, you are Sarah Rush. Oh, wow. wow. I went, really? Oh, my God. And there was Deborah standing there who played Jackie, my sister. And she comes over to me and she says, what is your name again? And I said, Lydia Korniloff, Korniloff. It's a really weird, long Russian name. I've got to find another name. And she goes, Korniloff? She goes, I work for a Gregory Korniloff in New York City for, for a couple of years. I was his secretary, but he moved to Holland in the shipping industry. And I went, that's my dad. <gasps> oh <laughs> my God. That's a God shot, I call it. G-O, a small G, God shot, an uncanny moment of synchronicity. It's Crazy. too weird to be random. So oh, Deborah absolutely. Out of 10 million people in New York City, Deborah worked for my father. I mean, that's insane. That what are the odds? That's what, yeah, what are the odds? Those are the little breadcrumbs on the path of life where you know you're in the right place. That's how yes. it feels. So I've had a lot of those magical coincidences along the way. You do. You have a lot of magical moments in your well, life. I think you're able to see the magic. A lot of people have those magical moments, but I don't think they are able to identify them or they think they're random things. But I love that you you see the magic. You just said, you hit the nail on the head. If you see it, if you can acknowledge it, that's what creates more of it. That's the key. Oh, I just got goosebumps. Yeah. Oh yes, exactly. And it's- I got goosebumps. Oh my God. I know, me... I know. It's like, and I, sometimes for me, it's like signs. Like I see a sign and I read it and it's exactly what I'm thinking, what I'm going through. And that's the answer. And I'm like, oh, I totally see it. Somebody else might pass it by and nothing. They don't read it, you know, but I see the magic and you do the same thing. That's why you will always be successful in life and happy because happiness is a choice. And yes. I, I look for the magic all the time because I would get depressed yes. otherwise because I grew up in a family that was, you know, not so much violent, but my mother, I didn't know until just now. Mm -hmm. She died um, in April. I just buried my mom and stepdad. I'm so sorry. Thank you, sweetheart. And I know you lost your mother too. I know you lost yeah. your mother too. Yeah. And uh, it's, the, it's the primary relationship of my life, but she of had course. more influence on me than anybody. And I spent my whole life trying to please her and trying to make her happy and make her love me. And I couldn't get her love. I, I couldn't get unconditional love. Right. God bless her. And I had a beautiful forgiveness of my mother. We have a beautiful, the past few years have been wonderful together. And as she was dying, kind of a miraculous thing happened, by the way, I didn't tell anybody this yet. But growing up, she was so tortured and so unhappy. And so, and I didn't realize what it was. We thought she was bipolar. It turns out she had borderline, yes. borderline personality disorder. Which They're is, very unhappy, very unhappy. When they make a child, they traumatize you. Yeah. You know, they, they, they completely traumatize you. Yes. Yeah, so I was always trying to just please her. And as I was writing her obituary, I realized I started putting in all these famous people that she knew. And my sister said, why are you dropping so many names in the obituary? And I went, because mom worshiped famous people. And then it hit me. I had to become famous for my mother to love me. Oh, my God. 
it's not really what I wanted, to be honest with you. It wasn't like, I want to be creative. I want to write directly, yes. create art in the world, you know, and make people laugh or whatever. But fame itself is very hollow. It, it really is. You, you're an artist. You, you have the soul of an artist. And you also mm -hmm. raise the vibration of the earth with your <laughs> words. I'm serious. Some people just raise the vibration. Other people bring it down. <laughs> <laughs> they send it to hell. But... You know, you bring it up with with your with sharing your experiences, and and you're like one of the most loving people I've ever met, and you you really love people, and you want to help people, and it's real, it's not bullshit. Um, you know, sometimes I get pretty reactive and angry. You know, I, I well, I you're human. Passionate. We're human. We're human. Yes. We're human. But you get yourself out of that. You know, we all react. We can stay in the anger and the guilt and the shame and the the sadness, but you have the ability to bring yourself out of it. And that's, you know, that that's, yeah, that's where like the, the enlightenment comes in, you know? Right. You need, yeah. We need to get ourselves out of it when fear strikes us or, or, you know, anger and all these negative low vibe emotions, we get ourselves out of it by going up to love, peace, joy, enlightenment. Reach for the highest thought. Like I had an incident. I've told this story once before. I don't know if I told it to you, but today I led a meeting in recovery all over the world, you know, in an international meeting. And I was trying, trying to talk about God. And God to me is love. Yes. It, not, yeah. yeah I, I'm not religious, but, I, but then I started reading, getting back into the Bible. And I realized it's, very, it's exactly what I think it is. It's, it's your, your thoughts create your reality. A hundred percent. Love. Love is the highest yes because god is love exactly mm -hmm. so one day i was out in the uh, taking care of my parents a couple of years ago and i had a, their motor home at the elks lodge parked in the elks lodge and my son was coming to visit and it was christmas eve and i thought i've got to get to the health food store and get some vegan a's vegan mayonnaise and yeah. close at 5 p.m and i rushed i said um siri navigate me to the whole wheatery and she took me to an adult, adult bookstore <laughs> <laughs> What? I think she thought I said whole eatery. Oh, oh I, I can't. That is so gross. I can't. <laughs> Siri <laughs> is like she is. She needs help. She Siri is the she worst. Therapy. Mind. <laughs> so, <laughs> I know. It's like so. Then I get to the health food store and I rush in like a maniac and I'm like, I gotta grab the one jar of veganaise and get home before Jack comes from. He's driving a long distance out there to Lancaster, and. There's a woman with 90 items in the cart about to beat me to the to the checkout. And I'm like, I gotta beat that lady. And I race in there and she beats me. Oh and no. I'm fuming with anger. And I'm standing behind her in line with one jar. And instead <laughs> of just asking her, me, I go ahead of you, I'm in a hurry. She I, I preferred to stand there and fume passive aggressively like an asshole. I just stood there and I went, I was huffing and puffing like making loud noises. <laughs> <laughs> and you make it very loud, right? So they know. <laughs> I did. I actually did this. I made a fake phone call to the hospital. Oh my god! <laughs> you did that. <laughs> no, I, I know you're in the emergency room, but I can't get out of this long line. I, I, I can't. And then I, then I realized I'm being a jerk. I'm being a son. <laughs> and I immediately said, "What's the highest thought I can think?" And when I ever reach for the highest thought, you know, I get slapped down immediately, and I. I said, oh, God, I got to stop this. What, what's the highest thought I can think? I'm thinking to myself, and I look at the back of the woman's head in front of me, and she's shaking from Parkinson's. <gasps> oh. And at that moment, I literally poured waves of love out to her, just oh. waves of invisible love. I felt so ashamed, and I was just like, oh. And at that very moment, she turned around and said, oh, honey, you only have one item. Go ahead of me. Oh, I'm getting goosebumps again. What? That's life works. <gasps> let go of your selfish greed and the universe oh changes God. like it's a circle love supersedes everything and and letting go of selfish ego and fear yes it's you the know, ego fear. yeah well, the ego makes you stay in the low vibe right like the low vibe the anger the fear wanting to be uh, wanting to have our way wanting to put ourselves ahead of others it's like they say it's by self forgetting that we find it's by letting go of selfishness that we find. I mean, really, you know, 
because my ego wants to be the king of the world and ego is edging good out or edging god out ego in the recovery program but or fear is false evidence appearing real you mm -hmm. know it's like i could live in my head all day and make myself crazy and half the things i think are true are not true a hundred percent yeah well we live in our thoughts really we live in our minds yeah if you think about it we don't really live on the outside we no. live in our thoughts right so your thoughts have if you link your thoughts up to divine mind or love yes. or the universal the letting love is so beautiful you can see it clearly when you're letting go of your own greed and fear and ego and all that stuff and you link up to the higher thoughts mm -hmm. and you can do that with meditation or just being very quiet at times and asking what's the highest thought i could be thinking and it's never one of regret guilt fear whenever i'm looking at the past and i'm feeling like ashamed that's not from nope God. You know, or whenever I'm in the future, too much worrying, that's not from God. I use the word God because it's, to me, it's good orderly direction and it's love. So I, Yeah, yeah. God is love, God is light. And literally, I'm, I'm studying like quantum physics for dummies. I have a book. <laughs> I love it, look. I'm not joking. <laughs> I love quantum, quantum physics. Quantum physics for dummies. Oh, my God. <laughs> I have a book called After Death Experiences for Dummies. Can you? <laughs> what kind of a. We kind of have low self esteem in that department, apparently, because we like, like the dummies one. <laughs> I want that book after you. I mean, that's like my favorite subject right now because we can create our own reality and we've shown on the quantum level. Oh my quantum God. Yes. That your, your thoughts create everything, really everything and actually the bible is not really the stories are not real it's all symbolic and all the numbers have a reason i'm like totally studying that and it's fascinating and it's wow. all the religions are the same basically yeah, yeah. it's all they're all the same yeah yeah love, 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 love. spiritual books because religion is about fear and control yeah religion it's, is man-made yeah man-made has not and they interpret everything <laughs> the way they want it so they can control and make you fearful exactly. and and you depend on them instead of yourself exactly that's exactly it yeah and i know religion i don't want to put down anyone's religion or faith. no not at all no 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 it's not it's not the people it's the leaders a lot yeah. of times exactly. <laughs> the, the people are great it's just yeah no, think no. einstein said coincidence is god's way of remaining anonymous so whenever i have synchronicities in life i feel like it's like this winking this beautiful yeah opening of the universe where i can see that the beautiful synchronicities a hundred percent laid out for me sometimes like i had an experience once when i was my, my marriage was ending and it was a horrible thing in my marriage he cheated on me and he was leaving oh, God. i didn't know he was taking my money too and and oh. I was just, but I, at that point, I just wanted to keep the marriage intact because I wanted that white picket fence life. I had the two kids and the house and everything. And my whole world was falling apart. And he was taking my stepson, who I love. I raised the boy since he was four. We were really yeah. close. And my little stepson had brittle bone disease, which is oh. um, osteogenesis. But I went outside and I started just grieving. And I could feel a heartburn, a heartache, like a knife, a burning sword went through my heart. That's how heartache feels sometimes. It's almost yeah. physical. Yeah, it, it is physical. The and spiritual I, heart is linked yeah. to the physical heart. Oh, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I just said, please help me. And I didn't, I hadn't connected with my higher power in a long time because I've been so involved in Pokemon parties and making the little boys happy and as you know, I raised three boys and two dogs, including my husband, and they all look like people <laughs> I have to do that joke every time. I, I love that joke. <laughs> I laugh every time. It's funny. But I'm sitting out in the lawn, and I'm like, God, help me. Or, you know, how do I feel better about this? And immediately, this is weird. I look up, and I'm sitting under a fig tree. I never noticed we had a fig tree in our yard until then. And had no fruit on it. All the years I'd lived there, no fruit. This is weird. At the end of this year of, of journeying through my divorce, yeah, it was full of figs. At the end, I, my life had come to fruition, you know, fruit. But I'm sitting there grieving, and these two butterflies come over and circle my head. Giant swallowtail butterflies. 
so I took this journey with nature for about a, you know, a few months and just enjoying everything I could see, becoming grateful. And the gratitude brought kind of little miracles, those synchronicities. And I told you about this another time about the butterfly and the peacock and all that stuff. It sounds really corny, but if you start it's all connected. Yeah. It's all connected. And you see the the link. I don't know what it is. And I a friend of mine is like, you know, whenever I point something out, like, oh, this is exactly what we're talking about. And that's the answer. He's oh. like, that's a lot of magical thinking. I'm like, no, can you see it? Oh, you know, it's like, yeah. You and it's like that. no. You can see it's I don't know what it is, maybe because we open our minds to something or we're open to to the magic, but there's magic constantly everywhere constantly. The problem is you don't believe in it enough and here's what i really know is true yes you just, it's crazy weird butterfly experience one day i it came to me strongly because i i've been wanting oh, this is so corny i wanted to see this certain kind of butterfly and it appeared out one day after i was grateful all day because i was finally in the moment of being grateful during my divorce and i spent a whole day just wandering around at the zoo and when I came home, the one thing I wanted was sitting there waiting for me, a monarch butterfly. I'd never seen one in person before. And I thought, this came to me immediately. Oh, the universe is interactive. It wants to show off for us. But we're never present enough or grateful enough to, to appreciate the magic. We're never there. We're never here now looking around us and saying, wow, I love this. It'll, it'll give you everything you want. But I only wanted the butterfly that day and I got it because I wanted, I was so grateful all day for everything else. And the universe is interactive. It needs playmates. It wants to show off for us, but we're never present enough. And it came to me, I kept writing it all down. And I went, and every time I practice this, being mm -hmm. present, yes. being in the moment and loving whoever I'm with and not thinking of what I should be doing, all these gifts show up. I mean, real gifts show up. Doors open, phone calls come for jobs. Yes. I'm not kidding. You got to start. Try, try believing in magic. And Wayne Dyer, whom I love, mm -hmm. he yeah. said, "You'll see it when you believe it." Not there the you go. I love that. I love you know, that. you know that. You know, time is an illusion. Really, time doesn't exist, no. right? Uh, so, like the past you is the same as the present you, and the future you. It's all the same thing. So, I had this revelation. I was like. I'm not in the present because we're always in the past or the future. We're planning our future, you know, what we have to do, or we're thinking about the past. Oh, they did this to me, whatever. Yeah. So like, if time is an illusion, then life really is a big present. Double <gasps> yes. Life is a big present. Present is the present, is the present. There you go. Isn't that interesting how you, I can't believe you, I'm so glad you're there now. You were always there. I didn't realize it because I've been there. I was there for years and then I took a little detour back to. <laughs> yeah. Party like, time. <laughs> Old habits are fun. <laughs> I can get mired in materialism and in, in yeah. wanting a certain jo acting job or, and then I'm resisting it. And I'm like, why can't I just let go of all this stuff and be happy and be here now? And when I do that, all the things I wanted somehow, somehow appear. The things that, are, that you need. Mm -hmm. Like I had this line that I said in my book once. Um, if I knew I could be this happy without getting what I thought I wanted, would I have tried so hard to get it and almost killed myself in the process? You know, I wanted all this huge fame on a level that was, believe me, you know, my ambition was without bounds for a while there. I wanted to be a famous writer and I wanted to be a Pulitzer Prize winning author and I wanted to create this new fabric and yeah. be a quantum physicist and all these different things. And I thought, just be here now and do one step at a time and enjoy who you're with and make someone happy and be the sunshine in someone else's life. And those little steps forward get you to this joy, inner joy. And that leads to everything else. Absolutely. But you have to love yourself first. Yeah. You have, to love, yourself. You have to love yourself first so you can't give it away. Because you ain't got it. <laughs> Low self-esteem should be classified as a disability. You should get like, you know, <laughs> you should get extra money if you have low self-esteem. There you go. Yeah. And we're not talking about being cocky, like, oh, I'm this and that. No, it's just knowing your worth and your value. I think that's the most important thing. Yeah. 
You're right. And just right. being, you know, just being. We're human doings nowadays. It's like, I want to do this. I want to be this. And it's like, just be. Yeah, you're right. And when you are, things will come to you. That's what's interesting. You know, this has been a really weird process. I, I was beating myself up for procrastinating on writing my book. And I'd written a very funny book. And one agent said, it's too funny. Your book is way too funny. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. What? How can it be too funny? Oh, it's too funny. You no, know? it's, oh my God. What? Literally said that. And oh went, my God. I'm done. <laughs> and it made me so insecure about it. I started making, I said, how do I make it deeper? Well, it is deep, but it camouflaged my, I used to camouflage every deep thought with humor. And by the way, when I got sober 26 years ago, I developed a sense of humor. It came out of nowhere. Everything became funny. Like every tragedy became funny. <laughs> I didn't have that ability before. And being enlightened doesn't mean you can't still be an idiot. You know, I was like, <laughs> you know, I, I got this enlightenment, but I was still kind of, I was like yeah. a brand new kid in the world. Like everything was exciting. Butterflies, Aww. you know, no longer did I want to kill myself, annihilate myself by drinking and doing drugs and cocaine and acid and all those things. But then I realized maybe he had a point because I was covering up the truth of my journey in life with humor and it can be a crutch. It can be a cover for pain. It's mm -hmm. a great cover. A lot of comedians are very depressed people and they end up being able to lift people up with their humor. I mean, look at Robin Williams, God bless mm -hmm. him. Yeah, well, it's a form of expressing your pain. Yeah, exactly. It really right. is. But as I've developed this kind of inner knowledge, this new knowledge, and I just discovered hundreds of letters my mother and I wrote to each other. I never knew. I found a letter two weeks ago after she died. I don't know what made me go through all this, these letters, but it opened up an entire new angle on life, which I never had before. And I think it was a gift. And I found one letter she wrote to me saying, I'm please forgive me for my psychological cruelty toward you. I, never, I was so cruel to you, Lydia. And then no wonder you had no sense of self. Oh my God. Wow. I didn't have a true self of my own. She always ordered me to be a certain way. And I thought she was now you had, I know why you had to get away from me to learn how to grow into your own self. And I went at the top of the letter, it said never sent 1989. She never sent me that letter. In 1989. And it's so weird because she was, she was so she was locked in a closet as a child by her mother for days on end as a little tiny girl and whatever demons she had to overcome as her mother only and i hate to say this i love her mother too that's my grandmother but her mother really worshiped the boys in the family and thought girls she didn't like girls she thought she was you know you know my mom used to call me a whore when i was nine years old for wearing a little bit of a sandal my mother had a complex yeah so who knows what burdens, what she grew up with, but I, I overcame this mm -hmm. with self-reflection, inner work, getting sober. Mm -hmm. And so sobriety is more of a, I used to self-medicate. And then I found this amazing gift of sobriety and recovery. And we did a show about that, my whole story before. And I was a crazy drunk. I mean, I- Really? I, I, Tell us some stories about <laughs> well, I was I was starting a play mm -hmm. and with uh, Jerry Bruckheimer's partner, John Simpson, who produced all these movies, Top Gun. And he invited me and I had went, went over to his house one day and we did cocaine and I never made it to the play I was starring in the next day. Oh, my God. And it made the director quit show business altogether. <laughs> Oh shit! Oh my god! And then I had an audition for an Oscar-winning director who asked me to come in. He says, "I love you. You're my favorite actress. I want you to read for the lead in the pilot. You're going to meet the network at CBS." And I brought a bottle of Evian and I filled it with vodka, poured the water out, put vodka in there. I said, "I'm too nervous to do this audition without getting high first. And I drank on the way there. I stuffed the Evian bottle in my gym bag and put it in the CBS ladies' room under the under the sink yeah call me in and i i i'm wearing stilettos like six inch high heels skin Ooh. tight jeans and they call me in and i stumble and i fall down on top of the casting director i bounce back up <laughs> there were seven men on a couch looking at me up and down 
and I'm just thinking they're looking to see if you're thin enough, good enough, young enough. And I was just so f- fucking nervous. And I remember just bouncing back up. And at one point, the button on my jeans popped off. And I think it hit somebody on the nose. I mean, this is like a that. That was the <laughs> it's, wow. only funny later. it's only funny later if you can live through it. I mean, that was the most incomprehensible, demoralizing. They call it incomprehensible demoralization. The worst <laughs> bottom I hit at that point. But I still didn't know how to quit drinking until I had my big awakening, which was a whole nother story. Do you think that that letter um, that your mom wrote, if she would have sent it to you, you would have seen it earlier in 1999? How would that have changed your life, your timeline? You know, because I think I believe that this is the quantum physics. You know, we have different timelines, right? Depending on the choices we make. How do you think that letter would have changed your life? Where would you think it would have taken you? It would have changed my life a lot. It would have changed a lot of things. I never felt she loved me unconditionally the way, you know, I never really felt I had a mom. I had a a person who was always, even when I became famous, by the way, she said, oh, celebrity, it's just ridiculous. She wanted me to be famous, but then she didn't respect the fame that I had. It wasn't Pulitzer Prize winning or Jackie Onassis or something. And I remember once in a grocery store, I said, mom, I'm in a celebrity tennis tournament. It's in the, in the National Enquirer. She goes, oh, how embarrassing. Don't call yourself a celebrity. And then two minutes later to the checkout woman, she goes, my daughter's in this magazine. Like That's the borderline personality disorder. <laughs> I'm familiar with that with my mom. Yeah. <laughs> They're crazy. Mom? They're insane. They're like, well, not crazy, but like they, they go from one thing to the other. You yes. know, like, and, and that's how I portray my mom in the shows that I write. Oh. And it's hilarious. Not when you grow up with that, but it's just mixed but messages. My, my mother also would constantly apologize. Now, she did get yes. very, very remorseful after she would yep. hit me or cut my hair off about, you know, yep. on the eve of the junior prom. And something else horrible I just discovered she did, and I don't want to talk about it yet, but mm. um, it was just too traumatizing. But she would always like, get on her knees and start crying and maudlin like tears will go up for days. Please forgive me. I love you. And, and it would be, it would be like a yo-yo where I'd have to then get, get engaged in making her feel okay for several days. Yeah. The phone calls would never end. I couldn't get anything done in life. And then I was never good enough. So, so I'm telling you right now, if anyone else suffers from, if they're the child of borderline personality, mm-hmm. there's so much help out there now. Very few people know that they have this. It's bipolar is more, more common. It's different. It's a whole yeah. different thing because they go through periods of mania and then like uh, oh. depression, but it's kind of more consistent because it's like for longer periods. I think borderline personality is like, it's like a switch, like from hot yeah. to cold, two seconds. And you're like, what just happened? She can go from rage to being nice to being, and in front of other people yeah. looks perfect. Oh yeah. Them. They embarrass you all the time. To strangers, she was a, a saint, but to oh me, yeah, was, but not yeah. you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I want to tell you, Grace. I I had such a beautiful thing with my mother the past two years and the year before COVID, and she had dementia, oh. and she also yearned. She kept having this beautiful face of yearning to, to let me know how much she loved me. She couldn't speak very well at the end, but a year before, I was taking care of them, and I got this house out there in Lan- Lancaster, Palmdale. Um, they had a big motor home and they lived in a motor home for years she and her husband after my father died when i was 21. but mom um i took her to the hospital one day and she sat there the whole time and i filmed her saying i love you lydia i love you you're my firstborn please forgive me and i kept we had a love fest going on for the past three years of forgiveness oh. and then a year, right before covid for some bizarre reason i went over to the house And I just had to tell her this one thing. I had to tell her, you were the best mother in the world. I let her off the hook completely. Mm -hmm. And it was like something I just had to do. I was compelled to do it. And I went over and I, she's very tiny at this point. And I held her in my arms. I said, you were the best mother in the world. That's all she ever wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, it wasn't true, but she wept in my arms and cried like a baby. And from that moment, I said, I'm never going to let her feel anything but love and forgiveness. 
and we had this beautiful journey of another year and then COVID hit. That was in February and then COVID hit in March or April. Yeah. And then I couldn't see her for nine months after Chuck died of COVID. Her husband, my stepdad of 35 years died of COVID, July, 2020. We couldn't bury him till just now, you know, just a couple months, a month and a half ago. But anyway, when she had dementia at the end of her life, Kath, I got vaccinated. I was finally able to go back to the house. My sister had been there after Chuck died. And my sister took over for after I took over for two years. My sister took over that year. Here's the miracle. This is the weird. I'm holding mom's hand. I was there for one whole day. Kathy said it might be the end soon. Let's tell mom she can leave if she wants. She's 92. And she couldn't swallow very well. When you have dementia, you can't eat or swallow very well. So we had popsicle sticks with sponges on them for thickened water and gel and soups and everything. And one whole day, we just played Mozart. I read to her from the Bible. She's a Christian scientist, so I read Mary Baker Eddy and held her hand all day. She held me really tight. It's just this yearning look in her eye, like a lifetime of just pain she wanted to let go of. And then I left. And of course, they always die when you leave. Apparently, she didn't want to do it in front of us. And it was the day Kathy turned her back. Kathy left the room. Mom died two days later. Kathy came back in the room and said, she sent me a text at 10 p.m. two days after I was there. And she said, Mom's gone. And she doesn't look happy. Her face was all like contorted. And this is the weird thing. Kathy covered her with a sheet and there was a dog visiting that was comforting my sister. And the dog jumped up on the bed and sat, slept next to mom the whole night of mom's passing. Yeah. And the dog then at midnight, Kathy woke up, she was in the chair next to mom's bed and there was a wind blowing through the room and a candle was flickering and the dog was mm. barking at the ceiling, this cute little dog yelping at the ceiling. And then the dog frantically goes over to mom, pulls the sheet off her and starts licking her face kissing her and the dog covered mom back up with the sheet. Mom was already passed. What? And Kathy's watching this whole thing. Like this dog is like, yeah, what's up with the dog? This cute little dog named Meltzer. And then Kathy pulls the sheet down in the morning. I think an hour later, it was like a couple hours later. And mom had a smile on her face, like the most beautiful smile you have ever seen. And I've never seen my mom at that much peace in her face. In death, she had a transformation. Wow. And Kathy said to me, I have goosebumps. And she said, I never seen anything like this. In death, she changed. And I, you know, I, I like to think she saw my brother, my little baby brother who died, mm. my father, her husband, and all her loved ones, you know. John Lovitz thinks that she did. Well, you become pure light after when you die, I guess. But the fact that her body changed into a smile that is we took a picture of it and i'm never going to show anybody but i have this picture and i'm like oh my god the peace on her face was incredible yeah wow what a story she saw god or, or christ or whoever you where whatever you believe um she's a christian so she i know that she's with she's with god yeah we go to the source. Light like, source. Yeah. Yeah. The light source. The light source. Yeah. Literally with the quantum physics, everything started with a photon. I don't believe we die anyway. I don't believe. No, we don't die. No. We don't die. We're energy. We're energy. Yeah. Well, this, what's right. moving this meat suit is your, your, um, spirit. Your, mm -hmm. you know, something is moving it. <laughs> of course. There's a movie about 28 grams or whatever. When you die, there's a little bit left. You're, you weigh a little less because your soul weighed something. Yeah. Isn't that something? Yeah. So much we don't know. I think being a seeker is the fun part. Being a seeker. Yes. Yeah. Seeker. Because we're constantly looking for, and we change our minds, you know, of, of what is, yeah. I'm, I, we're like the same. We, we like to research and, and see what's up. We want answers. <laughs> I don't believe in, in that we have to suffer. I think uh, yeah. like Zen Buddhists say, Pain is inevitable, suffering optional. Look, I have to tell you, I had a really weird, scary thing Friday. I had vertigo. I've never had that. Ooh. But I was heat all day long. And I came home and I the room started spinning for 45 minutes. And I'm like, yes. I, got, I told Larry, take me to the hospital. He goes, no, 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 you're fine. 
and it went away, but I prayed through it. And I believe prayer is the invisible transfer of love to another or to yourself. Mm -hmm. Love. And my body has healed from all sorts of things. Like I had a, a toe that was hurting for a couple of years and I just decided I don't want to have that pain anymore. I'm not going to believe that pain is more powerful than the love that created me. So there's a lot of healing that we could be doing that we're not doing yet. Uh, yes, because we haven't been taught. Yeah, exactly. We're taught that something external will do it for you when you can do it yourself. Yes, your body is an amazing machine. It's an instrument. Mind over matter, 100%. But the upper mind, the higher mind. The, the higher mind. mind, yes. Not the 10%, the yeah. 90%. Not the 10% of like the basic emotions and stuff. It's like the 90% that's unexplored that you can tap into. Exactly. That's the one that has the power. Yeah. The divine mind or, you know, some people, some people call it God, but um, yeah. our mind, our petty reptilian obnoxious mind that's always <laughs> jealous thoughts and, agree, you know, like, why can't I have that? That's not the mind we're talking about. No, it's so annoying though. Those thoughts, I shoot them away. I'm like, shut up. Like they're people <laughs> like shut the fuck up and leave me alone. You don't belong with me. I don't want you. Okay. We're not hanging out. <laughs> That's so funny. You're you right. We should, we should, <laughs> we go on the stage. We should do a show. We're talking to our other mind. Go shut up. I know. Wouldn't that be funny? <laughs> well, eventually we'll do our two woman show. <laughs> yeah, we gotta, we're going to still do that show. I just went on a long journey to find myself this year. And I found out what I really like and what I don't like. And, Frankly, we're doing this show with you is what I really like doing. And I didn't know how much fun it would be. I, this is wow. super fun. I know. We need to do a show. We, we, we will. We will. Yeah. Here we have great feedback. What a beautiful story about your mom. You. Um, Lawrence, hey, Lydia, you're the best. I, I agree. <laughs> uh, and, and Dave wants to, for you to tell us the infamous raspberry story. Or I your favorite did. movies are Car Caribou Ranch. Ranch. I told you the raspberry story at the beginning of the show. But yes. Raspberry. But um, he probably missed it because he he's a friend of mine, so he went to work and he was oh, here I to play. <laughs> um, Caribou Ranch was this recording studio up at the top of. I, I went to the University of Colorado in Boulder, which is the most beautiful place, mm -hmm. and I went as far as I could for my parents to get away from them. <laughs> I'm to California thinking if I go to Colorado, I'm closer to California. One day I'll get there. And I became, I was getting a business degree, a bachelor of science degree in business. God knows why. I couldn't even do math. To this day, I'm like, why did I, I thought it, my mother kept saying, be a Wall Street banker. Oh my God. Yeah. Me? I can you know. So I had to take accounting and calculus and I barely passed all those courses. But in the business school, there was, um, I was so ambitious and so this is really cool when you are driven to a goal and you focus your intention you'll get there somehow you're in the right place at the right time if you if you believe in yourself and something drove me to what well, i wanted to get into that caribou ranch and it was harder to get into the white than the white house it was like there was guards at the gate with guns and it's up at the top of netherland it's a big ranch where apparently Elton John recorded two albums, the Beach Boys and Chicago, the band Chicago, they own the ranch. And I thought, somehow I'm going to break into that ranch and I'll get a job there. And I tried, I went up there and I couldn't get in. And then I invited these two men to come speak at the business college. I was head of the marketing association. I invited the two concert promoters in Denver, Barry Fay, who promoted all the big, huge concerts, like, you know, Rod Stewart would come and wings paul mccartney and then i invited barry Fay and chuck morris who owned a big club called tulagi's on the hill in boulder boulder people will know this but jeff crump who's on facebook with me he's we went to college together he was my boyfriend in college <laughs> for sure. and um and i invited these men to come speak and listen to this i'm thinking i want to meet jimmy gersio the owner of caribou ranch but I invite these two men to speak. And after the speaking engagement, they go, Lydia, do you want to come to dinner with us at the Red Lion Inn in Netherland? I went, yeah. We go to the Red Lion Inn and who's there? Jimmy Gersio. And he sits with us and he says to me, hey, you should come up to the ranch. Do you want to work there? And I went, yes. 
So I get into this like super recording studio and I, I had the best time of my life. I met Billy Joel. I crashed Billy Joel into a snowbank. He wasn't, you know, a big star yet. He was making his big album, um, the famous album that launched his career. And he was married to a woman named Elizabeth Joel at the time. And I had to pick him up at the airport and it was in a big um, suburban four wheel drive. And I had a car, well, I crashed the whole thing into a snowbank and we had to have a rescue operation come pick us up. And then I got fired and Billy Joel got saved my job. Then years later, I ran into Billy Joel again with John Lovitz. And he said, Lydia, he was so sweet to me. And he says, you were the Shiksa goddess. And John Lovitz goes, you're married to Christy Brinkley. She's a Shiksa goddess. <laughs> exactly. I know, but you, you're Christy Brinkley. Like <laughs> the same girl. Oh, sweet. You sweet. are hot. Thank you. You're beautiful. You no, know, I decided to not be afraid of being my age anymore. And the other day on Twitter, somebody said, I'm looking for women in their 60s who can look like they're in their 60s. And I went, look, I've never had plastic surgery. I do a lot of smoke and mirrors. To, you know, we do good lighting and we do little tricks. And makeup. But we don't all have to be wrinkled and old looking. She thinks a 60-year-old woman should have gray hair with tons of wrinkles. No. If you live a life that's somewhat spiritual yes you're not going to be you know withered <laughs> absolutely yeah all women are beautiful all women at every age you know all bodies are beautiful everybody's yeah. beautiful beauty is just it, the way we've been programmed about beauty is such bullshit. i am so done with it i'm so done with it i am so done with it that's why i don't know if you know i do comedy and lingerie not oh, because, yeah. <laughs> because it was a dare from my manager. I did not want to do it because <laughs> I wasn't there. And I was like, fuck it. You know, this is the body I got right now. It's all I got. So, so I'm, gorgeous, Grace, you're perfect. We're oh, all thank you. No, it's it's all in the, I had a, a my photographer used to be a stripper. So she's oh. like, suck your belly in, shit down. <laughs> it's like, she has a me, booty out. And I'm like, I'm so uncomfortable. <laughs> Oh it my hurts. God. <laughs> See, oh, I, there's, there's a woman on Instagram who is normal looking and she, she loves to let it all hang out. Like I love it. Like there's a bulge here and there. We're taught in these magazines ah. by the advertising industry for years that we have to look perfect, airbrushed, toned with our waist. Yes. And they oh, actually they totally Photoshop those images. They Photoshop the for perfect oh. people. What do we have left? Nothing. Exactly. It's but now you have all these younger women in, on Instagram and TikTok. They're like, they don't give a fuck. It's like, oh. this is me. I'm in a bikini. I love my body. If you don't like it, go fuck yourself. And I'm like, oh, yes, yeah. queen. It's, it's like, great. Also, and by the way, if you're Samoan, you have a different body type yeah. than, than a, you know, a Anglo-Saxon Protestant Norwegian. And it yep. doesn't, it's not fair that they have to also ascribe, be that body type. You cannot ever be that body type. Absolutely. Definitely, you know? For the Absolutely. It's, it's ridiculous. Uh, here, look at Chris. He says, no one ages in California. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the silicone in the air from the breast implants. <laughs> it's like, sticks to your face. Yeah, it's really, right? Don't you think that in California would... Is it because we take care of ourselves? There's so much competition. Like everybody looks younger. I or you, you come to California to become a star. I used to to actually say, if you're going to come to California to be a star, get some training first. You, you, being cute is not enough. No, but people have come here to make it in show business, and they, I think they are. We're taught you got to be pretty or gorgeous, and pretty, yes. but you've got to keep up with that fake. <sighs> I don't want to, you know, promote not taking care of yourself, but I don't think we should be so extremely perfectionistic anymore. Yeah, I know. But I, I take care of ourselves more here. Yeah. I think we do. Yeah. But at the same time, I find a lot of people are obsessed. Uh, I have a friend who's like, perfect. She's like, oh my God, I have cellulite. I'm like, everybody <laughs> has cellulite. What are you talking about? You just started having it because you used to be skinny. Now, you know, you're getting some, it's okay. Cellulite is beautiful. It's you. Just embrace it. But she's like obsessed with it and like dieting and then and exercising a lot. And, and, and still she's not happy. It's like, just be happy with, you know, she's like, she wants me to call her fat. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not going to call you fat. 
oh, I hate that. It's I don't want anyone to have to suffer with go through what I went through or so, so many yeah. anorexia. Like I used to have this line, all human suffering is caused by Victoria's Secret. And that's now they're caused by <laughs> Yes. But all human suffering is caused by advertising, which makes us think we have to have white teeth and teeth are ivory. They're not supposed to be white. Did you know teeth are bone? So yes. these companies want you to spend money on fat-free foods and mood, you know, mood disorders. And we're all, mater the materialism has driven us all insane. Yes. We have greed of wanting more and bigger houses and more stuff. I'm so happy with less. I mean, I had to clean the garages out. I'm like, what was I thinking keeping all this stuff? Exactly. Or giving everything away. Oh, somebody else can use it. Like clothes oh. that we don't wear, I donate everything. I'm like, I'm never going to be this size. I'm never going to wear yeah. this. And just clean it out and donate it. Somebody else can use it. It's wonderful to start getting rid of things. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's better to have the less you have. We're going to die anyway, so... Can't take it with That's you. The point, yeah. So enjoy your life and have fun. Who cares? Just getting into that rat race is just exhausting. Hey, do you watch a lot of TV? Do you watch any TV shows at all? Uh, I am actually. Oh, you're gonna hate me. I'm obsessed with TikTok right now. So all I want. <laughs> really? I was like two in the morning. I'm like. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> I love you. You're so cute. I am obsessed with it. Yeah, I'm into animals. Like I'll I'll share with my son, um, pygmy marmosets eating peas. These cute little creatures. <laughs> this is why I get so much joy out of animals. Like what's yeah, they're so cute. cute. Oh, TikTok is full of those. Like the dogs oh, and the cats yeah. are so cute. They do the weirdest shit. Oh, that would be fun. So fun. Oh, I am addicted to TikTok. Somebody. Is there a recovery group for TikTok addicts somewhere? <laughs> My finger is burned from doing this. Like it gets red and like the skin is hardened from the heat from the phone. <laughs> She's lost her mind, everybody. <laughs> Grace's TikTok recovery group will start at 5 p.m. 5 a.m. 5 a.m. I love it because Chris is like, I'm too old for TikTok. You are never too old for TikTok. <laughs> never. Oh, no. Are you going to start making TikTok videos yourself, though? That's I think I will. Yeah, because I'm so obsessed with it. I might as well <laughs> make money do at it. Do they make money? Oh, yeah. If you have a lot of followers, you can make a killing. Yes. So but how do you do them? I mean, but why is TikTok different than just doing a YouTube video? What, what's the difference? Because they're like a minute long. Now they have three minute long videos. And a lot of people, you would be great, like the God Shots. Okay. You can do the God shots, keep them a minute, and oh my God, you can, and I'll, I'll teach you how to get followers and stuff, and um, yeah, because you can, like, like, watching people's lives, you can get followers or, you know, commenting and stuff. Um, yeah, I, I'm telling you, you should do it. Well, okay, by the way, I do have a God shots uh, podcast. I have two more coming out tomorrow. I stopped in April when my parents died, my mother died, yeah. till now, and Darlene, this is a God shot. A woman was using the term God shots and I trademarked the term in 2009 and God shots is something I heard in recovery all the time, recovery meetings, which is such a, by the way, recovery is amazing because you, you, mm -hmm. you have a fellowship of the spirit from all right. over the world and on zoom, all over the world, New Zealand, Iceland, and we all speak the same language and everybody shares mm -hmm. deep pain and experience and strength and hope. And we all end up laughing at the most horrible things you imagine. <laughs> Dark I humor. <laughs> I've heard everything you can imagine. The worst stories on earth. And we're laughing. I'm like, where else do you get that? But um, so I started a podcast called God Shots. And I, my lawyer wrote a letter to a woman who was using the same name, God Shots. And she, he said, cease and desist. And she called. She said, what do I do? I'm using this for years on a website. And we got on the phone together. And I said, oh, don't worry about it. You can keep using it. Do you want to be partners? And now we're partners. Oh my God. That Virginia is so Knight. cool. I know Darlene and she's a minister and she's also a nurse and a doctor and a practitioner and she's sober too. 16 years in AA. So we, I shouldn't say that. So you that guys is, have that. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, we're both um, doing it together and I'd like you to be on. That's what I was going to have you on the show. Also, once I get back up and running, which we started a couple days ago. 
And Daniel Lockwood is another one of our partners. So we're going to create this. We're collecting God shots from all over the world. Any synchronicities you've had. Mm -hmm. And I have an anchor and an Apple podcast and then a YouTube channel as well. That's so, great. You should actually have excerpts of it on TikTok. Okay, TikTok. You got to start. I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I need help. <laughs> You're so cute. I love you, Grace. You're such a sweet <laughs> Thank wife. Thank you. I love you. Oh my God. So and then cool. it's like you have like the witch talk, they call it, with the tarot card readings. So when I'm really tired and sad, they're like, you know, this reading is for you. There are no hashtags. I'm like, oh. <laughs> So I'm paying attention, right? And yeah. they start saying stuff and I'm crying. Oh my God, yeah, that's me. And then they say something I don't like. I'm like, fuck you, no. <laughs> Next. Oh my God, she's... I am losing my mind. <laughs> Slowly but steadily. That's good. It's good to lose our mind. We yeah. Don't that. My mind used to be such a bad neighborhood. I would never hang out there too long. Yes. I don't want to hang out there too long, right? I start getting... Depressed. I, there's a list you make. Somebody in the program said, God, every day I hear these lies I tell myself. And so I made a column, my lies and the truth. And mm -hmm. the lies I tell myself are somebody hates me. So that guy doesn't like me. He looked at me the wrong way. She didn't return my phone call. And it's never that. It's always the other people are just busy and they have other things going on. And it's never really about me. So we make it all about us. Uh, <laughs> I don't really want to hang out in my head too much, except if it's going to make me laugh. Yes. Or help somebody else. A hundred percent. But that's what we're here for. Love and help others. It's so simple. <laughs> Once I figured that out a few years ago, I'm like, oh. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Although we, you know, we're in our primal nature, we are the hunter gatherer. We are kind of, you know, our limbic system creates this fight or flight response and, yes. and we have a hierarchy of needs maslow's hierarchy of needs and once our certain needs are, so, are solved you know we have shelter and enough food then we can think the higher thoughts and get out there but the key is <laughs> when you're hungry you're not gonna be nice right right <laughs> hungry i'm not nice but the key is yeah Eckhart Tolle, Eckhart Tolle wrote a book called the power of now and he was starving broke completely at wit's end, had nothing left. And he sat on a park bench one day and said, I have to kill myself. I have nothing left in the world. I can't even survive and feed myself. And when you're in that lower level like that, where you're hungry, and he said, wait a minute, who am I talking to? If there's two of me, maybe only one is real, one is good. In other words, he realized he was talking to somebody and he decided to go on a journey of discovering the inner self, which is, Mm -hmm. what I call the kingdom of heaven or God, it's inside you. The kingdom of God is inside you. It's all religions say the same freaking thing. It's not out there. There's no anthropomorphic man in the sky with a long No, No. God is not a man, actually. Yes. The Bible says that. Exactly. How clear is that? God's not a man, okay? Yeah. But anyway, so he went on this journey and he started couch surfing at friends' houses and he became, now he might made a book that called so Smith, six million copies, six million copies. And discovered the key to life and it was all inside without a penny to his name he found the key to everything and it's like yes buddha did that christ did that yes now don't worry and your needs will be provided for yes your needs will be provided for but you have to tap into that 90 percent of the light part of our minds of ourselves and i think we reach that through meditation and it's actually scientific because when you're in the dark your pineal gland starts um, uh, giving you melatonin, right? And you get, yeah, no, I'm research. I'm, I'm crazy. <laughs> I want this. No, I want to hear more. Yeah, so melatonin, and it, but it has to happen in the dark. And it, this is all, like I'm studying from like the scientific point of view and tying it to the spiritual books. Yeah. They're really magical, mystical books that give you the formula, basically, to live a good life and and live and tap into that 90% that we are mind programmed to not tap into because the man in the sky is going to take care of you and this and that. No, it's in you. It's inside you. Yes. You it's can so read much. it. I went through a lot, a lot of hardship and I was really broke for a few years. My husband 
God bless him. And we had a great, by the way, I only have good thoughts about him. That's the key too, is to not harbor resentment and to forgive. And only the good remains in every relationship, even though we had a crazy fun marriage. I didn't know he was a con artist. He stole a lot of my money. Mm -mm. I got it all back in a weird way. I got back things through other means, through just, it's, you know, there's a thing in the Bible, what do you have in your house? I had things in my house that I didn't know I could sell. And I found a way to recoup everything. And all these magical things started happening because I stopped hating him, resenting him. I didn't want to sue him. And, you know, but I was telling you, it, you have to find it within. You can go through all sorts of hardship and you can find how resilient you really are. You it's know? all inside. The kingdom of God is inside you. The light is inside you. Totally. God is light. So the light is in you. You, just you know, the thing is to how do you tell people how to rely on that when they're really struggling? It's, it's I say, hard. I it, say, when I did it, I had to surrender. I raised my hand at a meeting and I went, yeah. I don't know how I got here even, but I give up. I surrendered my yes. own. I went, help me. And I admitted out loud that I had a problem. And I was in this room, uh, a, a recovery meeting, 12 step meeting. And that's when all the, the gifts came in because I was able yeah. to at least do that one little step. And I decided to pray. I actually threw the football in, in the lap of whatever that power is. I believe I acted as if there was a power greater than myself that loved me. Love and it. I literally had to let go of my own agenda. And that's when the gift started. So it's like, it's an easier thing to do than you think. You just have to pray to be willing to let go. To let go. That's, that's it. Right. You tap into that light within you. It's within you. And I think, you know, you were saying like, um, how can you help other people tap into that? I honestly think that sometimes we need to go through extreme situations, life or death uh, experiences where I think you can go to rights. You can like become resentful and want to die, or you can be like, okay, there's something that I need to tap into that I need to heal myself or I need to. And so I think that those extreme experiences in our lives are the ones that actually are the most, the blessing. And as I'm saying this, it's one 11, 11 on the live. Oh I'm my God. You. 11, 11. I used to have so many. <laughs> See the magic. Did I tell you about my 11? By the way, what you just said. Oh, you know, you and I are like the 11, 11 girls. Oh my God. Did I tell you my 11, 11 story? No, tell me. Oh, well, it's going to sound too occult, but wait, hang on. First, what you just well, said. It's not a cult. You're bringing like You're right, something to light that we're not trained or educated about. Right. But first, let me just say what you just said is really is incredible because it's through the tragedy that I found everything. It's through the worst moment of my life when I was falling down that I realized I was falling up. It was because I had I fell and crashed and burned in the most catastrophic way possible. The very end of my rope. And I had a really tragic uh, story of my sobriety. I, I'm not going to tell it here right now. We can do it another day. Yeah. Like before. But um Oh my God, at the end, other side of that, it was the best thing ever that ever happened to me was the worst thing that ever happened to me. I, I, and it's like, you can't give that to somebody else until they go through it, I guess. Yeah. You don't have to suffer to get this, but I needed to suffer to get it because I didn't, wasn't gonna, I needed to be hit over the head with it. Yeah, sometimes that's what we need. And it's like, why me, why me, well, because you needed it. <laughs> Dumbass. That's why I tell myself you needed that. You know, need you need that. an extreme experience to wake up. But um, other people don't necessarily need to suffer. You know, like no, going. they don't. They don't. They're smarter. <laughs> I'm not the smarter one. I'm like, oh, I'm get it. yeah, exactly. I'm very stubborn. Um, okay, here, Nate. This is thank you, Nate. Wow, this show has woken me up today. Thank oh, you. Thank I'm you. so happy. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, here we, I'm going to get a compliment in here. Two gorgeous ladies. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> Thank you. Our ego is happy now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we still care how we look, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, fortunately, a girl. Yes. Well, look at like, makeup. Yeah, I mean, like you know, a lot of makeup. I don't look like this. <laughs> <laughs> You've seen me not looking like this. <laughs> You, look, you always look good to me. We, you know, oh, you're so sweet. 
Women have never achieved as much as men because we spend too much time putting on makeup. Yes, and it takes money too. And the ones that did change their name to George. Look at this shit. It's full of like, <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't even fit everything. I have so much stuff. Oh my God. <sighs> so well, tanning cream and everything. <laughs> okay, we're gonna, let's see here. Lydia looks so much like Brooke Shields. Oh, what a uh -oh. Yeah, I can totally see it. Brooke when she was 11, I hope, right? <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> She's the Calvin Klein girl, yeah. I know. You know, we've been talking for like an hour and 15 oh. minutes, which is amazing. And let's do this. Would you be my guest when I come back? Because we are going to do, I'm going to do a summer hiatus. I talk about we, like I'm a production. I'm not going to one woman broadcast <laughs> production. <laughs> No, bitch, it's you. Okay, so <laughs> I don't know. we are gonna do a show. It's like we're gonna do a show. Okay, so do you want to be my first guest, September nineteenth? Yes, and we'll talk about the eleven eleven story then, because by there that time more we can keep it, you know, keep it percolating. Totally, and apparently people are enjoying, you know, what we're talking about. So oh. we'll we'll keep it rolling. On September 19th. Spiritual shows where we talk about something deeper than just showbiz. But showbiz is fun too. Yes, but you can tie the showbiz into, that's what I love about you. You tie it into spiritual, deep stuff that um, is relevant to because, because all of Because life is hard to get through. And if you imagine being, having to like have a career in the public eye where you suddenly wake up and go, Oh my god! I'm like a I'm like a trained carnival monkey trying to make everybody think I'm pretty and, and sexy. And by the way, I have a lot of stories about the Me Too thing that are funny. But in my first movie, I was under the deep blue sea swimming in Greece, and they were trying to get a topless shot, and I couldn't figure out how to stop them from getting a topless shot. So I put zinc oxide all over my body. Use <laughs> 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 the footage. It's like actors have to go through a lot to get a lot of shit. Yes. Yeah. A lot of it. Uh, so here, uh, let's see. Oh, we, we have to go on this one. We have to say goodbye on this one. Grace and Lydia are better than Brooke Shields with respect to Brooke. Well, we're both Leo women. So we'd love to be the queen from the beauties. Okay. So um, with that. When's, when's your birthday? August 20th. Mine's July twenty third. Okay, happy birthday. Oh, you're like on the cancer. Yeah, we remember I remember you're on the cancer cusp. I'm on the Virgo cusp. That's what we get along too, because Leo sometimes it's too much to Leo. It's too much, too much lioness. Too much. But because I'm I have the Virgo logical, like, you know, help others vibe and you have the you know, emotional, beautiful, magical, mystic. Oh, Cancer. yeah. So I think that that balances our Leo crazy ego. You need my agent. <laughs> it's so annoying. I, I hate that part of me in a way because it's like the ego. It's like pure ego. It's like, shut up. But I have the other thing where I want to stay home and like, I want to stay home all day. Yes. I don't want to go out in the red carpet anymore. And the other side wants to be on the red carpet. It's like totally. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I absolutely we both we've talked about this yeah we have that dichotomy you know yeah, yeah we want to I, I love chilling at home in my pajamas listen that's oh. been my favorite thing to do yeah cooking and watching Bosch we just yeah. finished Bosch now we finished um this Guy Pierce show called Jack Irish and I've seen and I saw Pelican Brief last night when they before they had cell phones oh wow Robert. So I was we're like into serial killer thrillers all the time. It's really cool. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. That's the cancer in you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. All right, girl. This has been uh, so much fun. So you are the best. thank you so much, Grace. You are the best. I, I'm just so grateful for you. We met at a party and I'm like, you're you're an angel. I always call you angel because you are. You're an angel. You're one of my favorite people I've ever known. Thank really you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in. You, your comments are so great. Thank you so much. And thank you, Lydia. Thank you. And, uh, and tune in September 19th because Lydia will be back. We'll talk about all <laughs> yes, we'll, we'll talk some more. All right. Bye, guys.